so I'm going to talk to you about Graal, uh, but maybe more specifically about the speculative optimization aspects of Graal, um, because Graal is just in, just in time compiler that uses uh, a lot of the speculative um, optimization that have been uh, touched by different presentations already, but I hope that I will give you more details and give you a better understanding of what uh, what it's useful for, um, how you can use it, what are the potential drawbacks. Um, yeah, so um, before doing that, I have to tell you that you shouldn't purchase anything or take any decisions based on what I'm going to talk to you about. Um, but more interestingly, I want to put um, this a bit in, in context. So Graal is a just-in-time compiler. It's uh, compiling Java bytecodes. Uh, so if it's compiling Java bytecodes, it means it's in a JVM, a Java virtual machine. In uh, this case, it will be the hotspot Java virtual machine. Um, so the in the hotspot virtual machine, Graal uh, can be used as a compiler, but that's not the only way uh, hotspot can execute Java bytecodes. Java also uh, Hotspot also has an interpreter, which will interpret those bytecodes. Uh, while doing so, it will generate profiling data. Um, Cliff told us the other day that also C1, the first compiler that kicks in, can also uh, generate profiling data. And then uh, another compiler, that, that would be C2 in the classical hotspot case, but in our case it's Gra, can take this profiling data, the Java bytecode, and emit optimized code that, so that things run hopefully faster. Um, and that means it limits uh, native code for the platform it's on. For example, um, x86 or Spark or this kind of things. Um, so just to make things clear, as I said before, um, in the VM, uh, we, uh, the interpreter gathers profiling data that the compiler is later going to use. But what exactly is this profiling data? Well, uh, the, for the most part, it's always about uh, knowing when you have a decision somewhere in a program, which one is usually <coughs> there. Uh, and that relates a bit to what we've seen uh, this morning with the uh, tracing compilers, where when you have a branch, you take a decision and you record which one you take. So profiling data is a similar idea. So for example, you will profile branches. Uh, I don't know, if switches, loops, this kind of things. Uh, and it will not just tell you which one you take, but also uh, how much, right? How many times did you take the Zen branch? How many times did you take the else branch? And then you can have a proportion. Um, the other places uh, where you can uh, take a decision in a program uh, involve types. For example, uh, if you have a virtual call, uh, depending on the type you have as input, you will go in a different direction. So same thing, the profile uh, contains information about the types that have been seen during runtime. Um, and again, it's the same thing. It will contain uh, information about a certain number of types and how many times it has been seen so that we can have relative proportions. Um, another thing that can be useful as well that is in the profile is also if you have a call somewhere, have you ever seen exceptions uh, coming back from this call? Of course, you could uh, profile a number of other things, but that's what we use and what we concentrate on. So, um, as I said, uh, what I want to focus on here is speculative optimizations. Uh, but before uh, talking about speculative optimizations, I want to try to give you an idea of why we might even try to do them. So, to do that, I will present a few examples. Um, so here, for example, we have a very simple snippet of code, uh, if two branches, um, and you have to imagine that instead of these comments, in the Zen branch you have a lot of complex code, ugly thing, and in the else branch you have some simple statements. And uh, when it happens, the, the condition that leads us to the Zen branch is very unlikely for some reason. Um, but maybe because uh, in a certain execution it doesn't happen, maybe it's an edge case, something like that. So it would be very interesting for the compiler if we could concentrate on the else branch, uh, which seems to have the most common code, and it would also uh, be interesting because then we could maybe get rid of this complex code.
code in the Zen branch. Um, a related thing is here we have some rather simple code, but this instance of check can become complex if we don't know anything about foo. Um, maybe foo can have a complex uh, hierarchy in the in the class uh, that, uh, in the class hierarchy. If we don't know anything, probably doing an instance of means probably a loop going up the the class tree, depending on what language you're in. In in Java, you also have interfaces, which might be even more complex to test. Um, so if we knew more about Foo, we might be able to um, um, uh, uh, produce more optimized code. However, for the, on the JVM, uh, we have uh, runtime class loading, meaning that in general, we don't know much about the class hierarchy because it can change at runtime. So uh, again, here we have something that looks a bit like the first um, First example, we have, we have a decision and we will either run some complex or some simple code. But when we look at, at the, the class we have here, um, we see that it, there's an obvious, you, you, we could easily optimize that if we knew that this method, this get method here, is always the one that gets called here. But we, we don't really know that statically. It's not really obvious. So. It, it seems like we could do something to uh, get there. And finally, um, uh, there is something else which motivates uh, speculative optimizations. It's the semantics of uh, high-level languages. Um, Java, which some people say is very verbose, it actually could be worse. Um, so if you look at this example, um, it actually has rather complex semantics. I mean, first, just, just the referencing this O uh, to call get already like uh, requires a branch to test that O is not null. If it's null, you need to create a new null pointer exception object, throw it, and wind the stack extra. And that's not the only place where these kind of problems can appear, right? So you're casting the result of the call. Same thing, you need to check the type, potentially create an, an exception, throw it. Same thing again there. When we dereference A, no pointer exception is possible. When we index into the array, we have the semantics of uh, to try to be safe, we have to throw index out of bound exceptions in case the I is not in bounds. So more checks, more code to handle all these edge cases. And again, here we have the box double, we unbox it. It might be no. Again, we have to handle the edge cases. And this makes this simple piece of code actually very complex in the compiler. You might need complex CFG to just compile this few lines of code. And complex CFG is bad for many reasons. Uh, or complex code in the compilation unit in general is bad for multiple reasons. I mean, first, it's probably slower to execute because it's complex. But also, it's actually hard to optimize. If you have, uh, even if you have a compiler that is for which each optimization phase is linear, uh, but still, if you grow the graph, you grow the time you need to compile the comp uh, this graph. Uh, and usually that's not the case. It's not always linear. So, um, yeah, so speculative optimizations. Let's see how we can deal with those, all these problems using this concept. So first, so the speculative optimization, the basic idea is to say you're going to make a transformation in the compiler that relies on some hypothesis that you don't verify during the compilation, which uh, seems a bit unsafe or unsound. Um, so we will see how we can make it sound. Um, there are multiple reasons uh, why you might want to uh, do this kind of, why you might want to not verify the hypothesis during compilation. So first, it might be expensive, and maybe you don't want to spend the time proving something, right? You just don't want to do it. You want to be fast. You don't want to verify your hypothesis. You just want to use them. That's so much easier. Uh, but the second reason is that it might not be possible. You might just not be, this, this hypothesis might just not be true in general, right? And then you cannot prove it just by definition. Uh, but you still want to speculate because when, here I said in the beginning, we have a just-in-time compiler. 
meaning that we run while the program is also running. So uh, we're not really compiling for the general case, we're compiling for a very specific case. We're compiling for the current execution with its current input data, with its current context. Um, so, in practice, I would say that uh, speculative optimizations or speculation can uh, appear mostly in two different shapes, two different ways. So the first one is to use guards. And guards, so we have seen also um, this morning guards in the Lua JIT, uh, because when you have a trace, you need to guard to, ch to see if you need to exit it. Here it's exactly the same principle. You have guards that check some condition, basically, that verify that in this, in this specific instance, what we uh, rely upon is actually true. And if it's not, if it doesn't hold, you deoptimize, you exit the compiled code, just like you would exit a trace. Uh, so deoptimize, this vocabulary is just, uh, mean, this, this just means that you exit the compiled code and you continue execution, in our, in our case, you continue execution in an interpreter that doesn't make any hypothesis. Um, just to note, this is also sometimes called OSR, uh, on stack replacement, it's just vocabulary uh, differences, but it in general means the same thing. So the second, uh, the second way uh, speculative optimizations uh, can appear uh, is assumptions. So it looks a bit like the general uh, definition that I gave in the beginning for speculative optimizations. Um, but so the difference that I would make between guards and assumption is the way you um, you check that your hypothesis was uh, funded, was correct. Um, so the, the assumptions is basically some kind of invariant, so your hypothesis, and this invariant will be maintained by the VM. So instead of having code somewhere uh, in the generated code that checks the, the, that the invariant still holds, the code will be somewhere, it's not in the compiled code. And if, if this invariant is invalidated, same thing. The VM pauses execution and deoptimizes all, all the compiled code that relied on this assumption. So um, maybe to make this clearer, uh, <coughs> I can give you an example of such an assumption. So for example, a classical assumption to make is to say a certain class is finite. It has no subclasses. So that's a classical thing to do in the Java world. So it means that in the code that uses the assumption that a certain class is final, you will not insert code to check that this class is still final, which would probably be complicated, uh, but rather in the code that is loading new classes, so the code that could invalidate this invariant, you will check that you didn't, that you will not, by loading new classes, invalidate previously uh, assumed invariant. And what, when that's the case, as I said, you deoptimize. Uh, I said here you, you pause execution, but why, why do you pause execution? Uh, especially you pause execution of the whole VM. Um, and the reason is that maybe when you want to invalidate uh, this assumption, you need to deoptimize code that might be currently running, and not just by in, in other threads, and not just uh, maybe the top frame of other threads, but also anywhere down the stack. So you need to pause all your threads inspect the stacks and deoptimize uh, any method that uh, relied on your assumption. So with this in mind, let's, let's see what we can do with the uh, examples we've seen before. Well, if, if it turns out, if profiling data shows us that the unlikely case is never taken in the current execution, obviously we just use the, the, the guard that I present before, so we, we guard that we don't take the unlikely case and then we deoptimize, we transfer to the interpreter. And if, that, if, if the guard holds, then we just execute the simple code and we're happy. But, so you, you might think at this point like, what's the big deal, right? We, we just removed a bit of code, yeah. The compilation unit is smaller, yeah, maybe. It's not going to change the world, right? Uh, especially since, as we've seen before, the first branch was never taken, so why would removing it matter so much for performance? Well, if we imagine, that, for example, that in this, um, in this uh, code 
that was just in the comments. We had, for example, some variable, and in the Zen case, we assigned it to some to some new object of a type, and in the else case, we choose a different type. So, um, in Graal, we use single static assignment, and uh, uh, as we've seen this morning with single static assignment, you get phi nodes, right? And uh, the the stick figure with the phi nodes might have seemed very cute and innocent this morning, <laughs> but it's not. Phi nodes are evil. They, they are the worst thing that can happen to you. And and why is that? Well, because when you have a phi node, if you try to do any kind of um, type analysis, data flow, you need to do a union, right? So suddenly, the type of f after this block, right, is full union bar. And that's not so good news for, for multiple reasons. Well. First, maybe when you have a union type, you cannot prove the things you wanted to prove before. Maybe you wanted to devirtualize a co some, some, some code down below. Uh, well, maybe you cannot do it because with this union type, you cannot do it anymore. You cannot devirtualize. But the, the other problem is uh, maybe you don't even want to have union type in your compiler. Union types are complicated. They, they require more memory for representation. It's just you don't want to implement that, right? So if you can uh, stay with simple types, it just simplifies your life. And that's what happens when we apply the technique we had before. Um, finally, uh, for the instance of uh, example that I showed before, we could, if we can then make the assumption uh, that this uh, class foo is a final class, then suddenly the instance of check becomes very simple. It's a simple uh, direct type check. We directly compare the class of the object to foo, and if, since that's the only class, since foo is the only class for which uh, it can be true, then we only check for this class. And here we use simply the assumption mechanism. And uh, finally, uh, we can use uh, a similar. Um, as no, but we didn't see that example before, sorry. <laughs> but uh, what we saw before was this uh, example where we had the complex semantics of Java and uh, where we have all these exceptional cases. Um, well, since they are exceptional cases, we don't expect them to happen at runtime, so we apply the same idea. We just uh, don't include the exceptional code in the compilation unit. We, we still have to check that we don't run into those exceptional cases, but at least we can just de-optimize and not have to include this code. Okay, so that's all good. Uh, we've seen how we can use uh, speculation and how you can simplify the code, make that analysis uh, more precise and uh, allow more optimizations, such as devirtualization, for example. Um, but What's the cost, right? Is there a drawback to using speculation? Well, there's one that is obviously and actually not that interesting, which is that if you're using guards, for example, you have a runtime cost because you still need to execute the check. But that's not the most important thing because even before using speculation, we were already making the check. Uh, and and uh, But maybe where it becomes more interesting is when you think about assumptions. So assumptions, they transfer the, the runtime cost to somewhere else. So instead of having guards in your code that check for something, <coughs> you have extra code in another piece of the, of the runtime that checks that the variants are not violated. So for example, in the, in the case of the class loading, it means if you want to make this assumption that some class are fi effectively final, uh, well, you will need to add some code which will have some runtime cost uh, while loading new classes. However, that allows you to put this runtime cost in a place which hopefully executes much less than your code. You hope that you mostly execute code, not mostly load classes. So um, a more interesting um, aspect of using speculation, more some, some, some cost that maybe doesn't appear um, at first uh, when you talk about speculation is the memory footprint, the memory costs. Um, and why, why does this whole thing cost memory? In nowhere did I say we're going to use memory. Um, so the problem is that I, I, I didn't talk about something. I just said when you use speculation, you will de-optimize. You will just 
resume in the interpreter. But how, how does that work exactly? It's a bit magic. So first, I say you resume in the interpreter. The first question is where, right? Where are you going to resume? So you first, you first need to know in which method probably and which program counter, or in the case of Java bytecode, which bytecode index you're going to resume execution. Um, and, but that's not enough, right? If you just resume execution like that, it's probably going to crash because you, have, you don't have the data that was supposed to be computed before. So you also need to uh, restore all the, in the case of the Java virtual machine, you need to restore all the local variables and all the stack variables. Um, so it means that associated to, to any de-optimization point in your program, you will need to have metadata that describes this target and where to find in the state of the machine, where to find local variables, where to find stack variables. For example, this could tell you, well, local variable zero is, I don't know, in, uh, the reg in some register. Uh, the first element of the stack is also on the machine stack or something of that kind. So that's some memory you will have to associate with the optimization point. There are other techniques you could say, well, I'm not going to use metadata, I'm just going to emit code that adapts uh, the, the compiled frame to the interpreter frame for this specific call site. But even if you, if you do that, you're still using memory. Uh, okay, it's code, but it's still going to take some memory uh, in your code cache. Uh, one thing that is important is that usually when you have a compilation, you also apply inlining, meaning that you will not have only one of those elements, you will have actually a whole stack, right? When you de-optimize from one compiled frame, uh, this might correspond to many interpreter frames. So you have a whole stack of these things at each point where you might want to de-optimize. Um, so you might think that this is not very important, but it is. So if we, if we look at some numbers, um, we, here I've represented uh, what, what the data that gets installed in the code cache, so all the result of the JIT compiler into the code cache of the hotspot VM. And this is just some Java benchmarks, right? So if you look in grayish, uh, down there we have the code, right? So we have some code, well that's good because that's what we wanted out of the JIT, uh, but we also have these red things here, right? And these red things are just the optimization metadata. And as you can see, the amount of the optimization metadata is not really negligible in front of the code. Uh, so you cannot just uh, put this problem under um, the rug. You have to deal with it. Um, now, another case. So um, we have a, very often when we, we talk about Graal, we also talk about this Drupal framework. Um, Chris will later talk to you more about this. Uh, but in short, it's just some framework that you can use to implement dynamic or not languages um, and get them hopefully very fast. Uh, and how it's linked to the Graal compiler? Well, it uses the Graal compiler to do the compilation. And we have a, a JavaScript engine, and so we can run the same type of measurement that I just ran, uh, but just for some JavaScript benchmarks. Uh, I think those are Octane benchmarks. And there, I don't think that anybody can see the code anymore. There may be a bit, there's one pixel here. What's the factor of this? Sorry? What is the factor? So the factor, yeah, so if we, if we compare the absolute numbers, here we have between uh, 50 and 300 megabytes, right? If we look at the pre previous slide, we were between five no, and... No, sorry, what, what's the factor between metadata and code? So how much more metadata than code do you have? Uh, I don't know, 100 times more? I don't know, there's one pixel here, not there. <laughs> it's, 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 there's no more code, right? It's over, there's no code. There's mostly metadata. Um, so that's no good, right? I mean, that's no good. It runs, right? But it's actually a problem uh, because uh, at, at some point, at least in Outspot, for example, uh, the code cache has a limited size, and if you have no more code cache, you stop compiling. Might be okay, might be very, very bad, right? Uh, because maybe you have a lot of not very useful things compiled, and when you finally reach the compilation of your important hot method, you have no more code cache, so you've lost, right? And yeah, so uh, the if you look at, at this, basically we have a 10x, right? So compared to the previous uh, Java benchmarks, we have about 10x more data overall in the code cache. So that's definitely a, some uh, cost that we will have to look at carefully. Um, 
No, I want to talk to you about another cost or rather a constraint of using speculation. And this one's going to be more about how using speculation in the compiler, speculative optimizations, is going to constrain the design of the compiler or the IR. So I will show you some examples to try to derive a few rules that are important to respect um, as soon as you're dealing with uh, um, as soon as you're dealing with speculative optimizations. So here we have some Java bytecodes. Here we have two put fields. Uh, so put field just stores some value in memory in a field, right? So we don't really care about what's above or below. The important thing is only this, this code. So first, the compiler is going to parse this, right? And it's going to parse something above and below. But more importantly, at the end, you will end up with two writes. You will need to write those values to memory. So we will write A, we write B. Um, so now I want to make a little experiment. So what happens if the compiler decides to do that? And that means swapping the stores. So you want to store field B before A. Uh, yeah, field B before A. So why would you want to do that? Uh, there are many reasons. Um, one of which may maybe, I don't know, A maybe is after B in memory. Then you could store both of them using one store. Uh, maybe uh, you could fit in between a number of instructions to hide the latency, memory latencies, for example. But you cannot do it because of uh, data dependencies if you uh, schedule the writes in this order. Anyway, that's not really the important thing. I think the important thing here is the compiler has decided to do this transformation. Um, now, later in the compilation process, um, we used a speculative optimization and to, to speculate, we needed to insert a gap. So we needed to insert some check and if the check fails, we deoptimize. Okay, why not? Um, but now, what can we do? Now at this point, they say compilation is finished and we want to emit code. So as I said, deoptimizing along, you need to know where you deoptimize to, right? Um, so let's see, what, what could we pick as a deoptimization target? So we could try to deoptimize before these two bytecodes, right? So if we think about it, we would have the program execute the first write to B, notice that it needs to deoptimize, deoptimize write A, write B. So we've written B twice, and uh, that's not so good for uh, the Java memory model. In general, you can just not do this kind of transformation. So we could deoptimize in the middle. We didn't really solve the problem. No, we wrote B twice, and we forgot to, to, to write A. That's just, no, will not work. And same thing, if we deoptimize below, anywhere below, uh, we brought B, we forgot to write A. There's, there's no target where we can deoptimize and still get correct execution. So we've, we've put ourselves into a bad situation. At this point, the compilation is to abort and it's over. So what did we do wrong and how can we prevent it? So basically what we have, to, what we have learned through this example is that if you, if you have two uh, side effecting instructions, you cannot, re regardless of if they are near to each other or far away, but you cannot reorder them if you can later, uh, if there is currently, or you can later insert an optimizing instruction in between. And that's impo the important thing is if you could insert, because of course you can always check at the moment, okay, there's no, there's no optimization instruction currently uh, in between, so I can do it. But then you have to guarantee that never later in your compilation pipeline you will uh, insert uh, another deoptimizing instruction. So, okay, so I want to go back to the example and we will uh, avoid the mistake of, of uh, uh, swapping those instructions. So uh, here it's the same situation. There can be even anything you want in between the two put fields as long as it's not a side effect. Um, so we will parse it again. This time we don't swap them around, and we later insert uh, a deoptimizing instruction. We speculated on something, and we need to deoptimize. And so, in the case uh, where we would deoptimize, where could we go to? So, if we went 
before, we would have the same problem, right? We would write A twice. That's, that doesn't work. If we go in the middle, we would execute write A. We would notice we need to de-optimize. We would do the de-optimization process and re restart uh, in the middle between the two put fields. And we would finally execute the write to B. And that's good, right? It looks exactly like the original program. Basically, the a program could not tell except by timing, of course, if, if we de-optimized or not, right? So this is what we want. So w what's the takeaway there? Well, the takeaway is that if there is a de-optimizing instruction between two side-effecting instructions, the de-optimization target needs to be between the corresponding side-effecting bytecodes. So here, it just means if you have two uh, if you have a optimizing instruction here, you can you can choose your target, whatever it is, in between those two side effects. Okay. So first, now that we have a bit an idea of what are the constraints regarding uh, what you can do, what you cannot do uh, um, when using speculation. I would like to talk a bit about the, the Graal IR. So first, in general, so the, the Graal IR is a static single assignment form. Um, so it has fine notes. Um, and as you can see, when we compile this little uh, snippet of code with uh, a if, um, with two different assignments to some variable, um, we can clearly see uh, in red here the control flow, which looks like what you would expect, I guess, uh, from from this code, uh, just to if two basic blocks and then you merge the basic blocks together. Um, then on the side there we have uh, this data flow where we have the phi expected to resolve uh, the two writes to foo, um, and on one side we have the addition that we expect from the then branch, and on the other side we directly go to some value that is computed in the rest of the graph. Um, however, uh, what, what might be a bit surprising is that the, this data flow that we have there and this control flow does not seem to be linked or there doesn't seem to be an obvious relationship between the two. And uh, that's, that form of IR is basically uh, the same one as the, or very similar in in its idea to the one used in C2, or I believe to the one used in Turbofan as well, with slight differences. But uh, the idea is there, the, the, the main concept to understand is that <coughs> we try to not have any useless dependencies. So we try to uh, capture the semantics of the program using as few dependencies between the nodes as possible. And as far as Java semantics are, are uh, concerned, the addition between these two values, it, it doesn't matter where, where it actually happens, right? It doesn't matter in the control flow where it happens as long as it's available to anything that uses it, right? So that's why this add node there is not linked to any kind of control flow. Uh, a difference that you uh, cannot also compare to uh, C2 or what was presented uh, before uh, for Turbofan is that uh, in Turbofan, all the edges go up, uh, so you always say what you depend on. Here we can see that some edges point down, some edges point up. The, the idea there is that the, da the data flow points to inputs, so it points up, and for the control flow, the edges point to successors, so it points down. And the rationale there is, uh, usually when you do data flow analysis, it's, it's very intuitive, or at least that's the way we used to do it, uh, to, to traverse the graph from a node to its inputs, uh, while when we do control flow analysis, it feels more natural to go from the start of the method to the end of the method. So that's kind of, so that the, the pointers in the actual IR are in the direction with which, in which you usually iterate over the graph. Um, okay, so to come back to this thing about like this add node not being anywhere in the control flow and uh, the problem is that uh, CPUs don't work like that, right? You just don't have dependencies between things and then 
yeah, at some point you need to emit code. And when you emit code, you will need to, to emit this kind of instructions somewhere in some block, in some basic block. And this is done simply by scheduling this graph. So uh, if you can think about it like this graph, you have a partial order between the nodes and you just want to find a total order between the nodes and you apply some form of schedule uh, to achieve that. Um, of course, uh, th this graph, the, the, the input graph there to the schedule, uh, you could have placed the, the add operation before the if, right? You don't really need to place it in one of the branches. However, that's uh, suboptimal because if you execute the add regardless of the branch that is taken, you might be losing time, you might be wasting time. Um, so in the scheduler, we use a simple heuristic where we push uh, operations and instructions in branches because usually, uh, I mean, the branches have a lower or equal probability to whatever um, uh, their dominator is. Uh, and of course, we try to avoid pushing things down into branches, uh, into, sorry, <laughs> into loops. Uh, because loops are usually uh, executed more often uh, than uh, the code that precedes the loop. So we use these simple heuristics to get uh, an op uh, a good schedule. Um, this also means that if the programmer had put the addition operation before the if, then the schedule would just move it naturally to the right place. And also regarding loops, this also gives you uh, um, loop invariant uh, code motion for free, uh, just as a side effect of scheduling. So, uh, so I just uh, said something about loops. So if, um, in the graph IR, loops are represented explicitly, meaning that we, you have an explicit loop begin node for the entry point of the loop. We have loop exit nodes when we know that the computation is never going to re-enter the loop, and loop and node just means there's a package there. So uh, you, I said the loop entry, meaning that there is only one loop entry, meaning we, on, we don't support irreducible control flow. Um, so that has not been a problem in practice for two reasons. So the input of this compiler is Java bytecodes, and it's extremely unlikely uh, that we meet Java bytecodes with irreducible control flow simply because Java C does not emit this kind of code. Um, so this um, constraint is not a problem in practice and it simplifies uh, some, some algorithms and some the implementation of the compiler in general. Um, another thing that was uh, mentioned uh, in the talks earlier uh, is that um, having only one loop entry might be a problem for OSR, but that's, so OSR is on stack replacement. When you enter the code, you would enter a method uh, directly at the beginning of a loop. So obviously you would need two entries into the loop. Uh, that is not a problem, and I think uh, TurboFan and Graal in this, in this case take the same approach, which is you can always peel the loop or the loops uh, until the OSR entry point is out of outside of all the loops, so you don't have a problem anymore. Uh, your loops uh, are all <coughs> with a single entry. Okay, so now uh, let's see how all of this uh, influences the the, the overall structure of the compiler. So what we do in Graal is that we divide the compiler into two main stages. Um, so the first stage is the stage where you're going to be able to do uh, speculative optimizations, meaning you can insert new guards, you can insert new deoptimizing instructions, you can also move, move the instructions, meaning if you have a guard in some block, you could move it to another block. You can optimize uh, this kind of things. You can optimize as um, deoptimizing instructions. Uh, however, in this first stage, uh, as we've seen before, if you're moving around or inserting um, the optimizing instructions, it's dangerous, well, incorrect, to start moving side effects around. So in this first stage, uh, side effecting instructions just remain fixed, they don't move. Uh, and then we don't have the problem. Um, then 
there is a transition that leads us to a second stage where basically things are turned around. So now this, all, the, all the optimizing instructions are now fixed, they don't move anymore. Uh, you cannot insert new ones, you have to have done all your speculative optimizations already. Uh, but at this point, you can do uh, whatever you want. Or, um, at least you're more free to move side effecting instructions because now, since there will never be a new optimizing instruction, you can reorder side effecting instructions. Okay, so the first stage. So in the first stage, uh, the representation looks like this. So this is an example of what you would see in the first stage. So here you have a guard node. So this guard node, the semantics is just, <coughs> it executes, it takes a boolean as input. Here, some kind of null check. Um, and if the, if the boolean is false, it deoptimizes. Um, so when, when this, this floating nodes, all these nodes that are not attached to the control flow, uh, you, can, you can think of them as being like, if, if it's functional, right? If it doesn't have side effects, then you can float it. So you can make it floating. So you, that, that means that actually this deoptimization operation, in a sense, uh, doesn't have side effects. But that, that seems a bit weird because it must be a complex process. How does it not have side effects? Well, in practice, it has a lot of side effects to the VM, right? Uh, you, the, the optimization process has a lot of side effects. But as far as the Java program is concerned, there is no side effect. Uh, you cannot observe that there has been a deoptimization. Otherwise, there's probably a bug in the deoptimization. So we have this guard, and the the guard node is used by, in this case, by a read node. So if we look at the snippet of code this this corresponds to, we had here some kind of read, and in order to read the field, we need to ensure that the receiver object is not null, which we do using uh, by having a dependency on this guard. Uh, which And this dependency ensures ordering, meaning that in any valid schedule, the read node will be after the guard node. Um, the other interesting thing here is that we see an unexpected edge between the guard and some part of the control flow. So the reason for this is here we see that this read, this, the, the place where the guard is needed, this null check, happens in a branch. Right? So what would happen if we move the guard above this if, right? What would happen there if we moved, uh, if we allowed the guard to pass before the begin and the if? Well, we might de-optimize because maybe this object is null, even though we would never have entered the branch, uh, and which means we de-optimized for no reason. It was useless. We didn't really need to de-optimize. And so we're going to pay a big runtime cost by continue exec continuing execution in the interpreter while we didn't need to. To avoid this kind of problems, uh, we need to restrict the movement of a guard and anchor it into a specific branch uh, so that this guard cannot move outside the branch. So it will be basically only in places where we know it will be absolutely needed. Um, the other thing here uh, we, that we can see is this frame state node. So the frame state node corresponds to this uh, deoptimization metadata that I've been talking about earlier. I've said before that deoptimization needs to have deoptimization metadata to know where to deoptimize to. So here it's a bit strange because it's not associated with the deoptimization, but it's actually associated with the side effect. So that's the model in the first stage. Uh, each side effect has uh, a frame set which represents the state you could deoptimize to if you were to deoptimize just after uh, executing the side effect. So this frame state here uh, would contain the target, the, the target just after the corresponding uh, bytecode, just after writing X in the bytecode. We will see how this is useful later. Um, so that was for the first stage, where you will do all your speculative optimization and set guards, move them. So now we need to transition to the second stage. So this is done in two steps. So the first step is uh, guard lowering. So we said uh, that in the second stage, we need to have our guard fixed. They cannot be floating. They cannot be moving anymore. 
So well, let's take care of that first, right? So we do a schedule, as I explained before, which means the guard will be in some block, and at the position where the, the guard is scheduled, we lower it, meaning we transform it into lower level nodes. Uh, in this case, we transform it into if deoptimized, which is the same kind of structure that you would have for any kind of user code, uh, the same if node. Um, and it will just, if the condition does not hold, it will just lead to a branch which always terminates, which is a control flow sync uh, as far as the compilation unit is concerned. Um, on the other hand, if the, if the guard holds, then we enter a block in which uh, the condition that was necessary uh, is guaranteed. And so the read node, which in the first, um, in the first stage depended on the guard, now just depends on the uh, block. It needs to be below the block where the condition it needs is guaranteed. The, the second uh, uh, phase of this transition to the second stage is uh, what we call frame state assignment. So what is this about? Well, as I said before, in the first stage, frame states um, have associated to them a frame, uh, sorry, side effects have associated to them a frame state which tells you where you would de optimize to just after executing the side effect. And we have seen earlier that for any de optimization, uh, between two side effects, all the, the all the instructions between the two side effects in the in the bytecode stream are valid the optimization targets, which means that for all the, this the optimization we can assign as a the optimization target the frame state of the previous side effect. So this is what we do here. Um, <coughs> these two the optimizations there get the frame state of the first side effect. And this optimization down there gets the frame state of the second side effect. Uh, because if it were to deoptimize to this side effect, then we would skip this uh, side effect in the, the second side effect here. Um, you can also see that by, by doing by assigning the target of the optimization using uh, this technique, we we have we will have very often this kind of pattern where multiple deoptimization instructions will point to the same frame state, meaning they would have the same target if the optimization were to occur. So this will be important later. Okay, so now we've transitioned into the second stage. Uh, what, what can we do there, right? Uh, so, as I said before, it's used for um, optimizing side effects, so meaning reordering them. Uh, and an example of what you can do here is if, if for example, you have two writes and you would like again to write field x before field y because maybe x and y are two ints that are contiguous with x first and y second uh, in memory then you could use a single long store to execute those two st stores at once uh, and so to do that you will push this write of y down the control flow uh, so when you have a control split you have to replicate the writes on both branches, which is what we see here. Uh, at this point, there is a deoptimization, so this side effect cannot be swapped around this deoptimization, but that's okay. This branch, anyway, is not hot. It's basically your slow pass. It's the thing you hopefully will never hit. And on the other branch, you can reorder uh, the side effects as you wanted in the first place. Um, so to recap, this is the process. Uh, speculative optimization first, your, your, your deoptimizing instructions are floating and can be moved, side effecting instructions are fixed and have a frame state associated to them. Then we transition first using guard lowering, then frame state assignment, and then in the second stage we can uh, optimize um, side effecting instructions, meaning reorder them, uh, while on the other hand any deoptimizing instruction is fixed and as an, a target assigned, a frame state. Okay, so now I would like to, to talk a bit about uh, some more concrete optimizations that can be done uh, in those stages. So the first optimization I want to talk about is called speculative guard motion and it's an optimization you can only apply during the first stage because it moves um, the optimization instructions around. 
So the idea here is that we have uh, this loop, um, and inside this loop, we have some branching uh, construct, in this case just if, uh, and inside one of the branch we have some guard. Um, the important thing is that this guard uh, takes a loop invariant uh, condition in, right? So you would very naturally uh, be tempted to move to hoist this guard out of the loop. However, we have this edge that I talked about earlier that prevents moving this guard out of its branch. Um, and that's why this we will still do it, but that's why it's called speculative, because we actually don't know what is the relationship between this condition C and the condition under which it is executed in the loop. For example, maybe when C is false, then the loop is never entered. Or maybe when C is false, then this block of the loop is never entered. So moving it ab above the loop might uh, is speculative because it might be optimized for no good reason. However, uh, we still do it. Uh, we do it uh, simply by moving this uh, anchor point to something, to the branch above the loop. So this looks very simple, but it's very effective. Um, however, if you were to de-optimize because of this guard, then you need to be careful in the next compilation. You need to not repeat that mistake, because obviously, apparently it was a mistake if you de-optimized. So this is done simply by first using profiling information, meaning that at the next, between the deoptimization and the next compilation, hopefully uh, profiling information is gathered that tells you uh, that you should not do this optimization. But in this specific case, there is simply a, a speculation log, which is something where we um, log any speculation that has failed so that it's not attempted again in a further compilation. Um, so this is very simple, but it's effective, and it especially you can, uh, there is a few refinements that you can apply to make it even more effective. So first, uh, as we've seen, this applies to uh, conditions that are already loop invariant, but you can actually make more conditions be loop invariant. For example, if you add a comparison between an induction variable and some other uh, loop invariant value, you could simply uh, compare the, if you are in a counted loop, it's easy to know what are the bounds of this induction variable. And so you can simply compare both the both extremums, the minimum and the maximum of this induction variable to uh, this value. And that now is a, an expression that is loop invariant. So we have one more guard that is uh, that can be hoisted. And that's very interesting because that's what a rebounds check looked like. The rebound check looked like something like this, meaning an induction variable usually uh, uh, compared against some uh, uh, value, probably the length of the array, well, most certainly the length of the array, um, which is loop invariant usually. Um, the other uh, thing that you have to pay attention to is um, if, you all, if you process the guards in the right order, many more guards with, will actually hoist. The reason for that is that once you've hoisted one guard, maybe there was code that depended on this guard that can now be hoisted as well, and maybe some guard depended on this code. So you have very often guards that depend on, on another one. Um, and so if you process the, um, the guard that is dependent upon first, well, you can hoist the second one. Um, and the last thing is, um, if you want this to be uh, to have the most benefit, you have to be a little bit careful about the relative frequencies. What I mean by that is, um, I said earlier that um, it's nice to move things out of loops because usually uh, loops are executed, the, the, the body of a loop is executed many times, but that's not always true, right? There are programs in which the loop, some loop is never actually entered. Um, and in this case, it would be a mistake to hoist code out of this loop um, because then it would be executed more often. Uh, so also, even if the loop is entered many times, maybe a specific branch within a loop uh, ends up being executed uh, on average less than uh, the time the, the branch above the loop uh, is ever reached. So in, in this, when you do the hoisting, you have to always be careful to compare the relative frequencies of the block you're moving things into and out of. Um, so, 
Um, to give you maybe a more concrete, direct example of what this means, um, we have here some loop that accesses uh, an array. Uh, we have this array access there in some branch. Uh, to because of Java semantics, we have to insert uh, a check that the array itself is not null and that the index used to index into the array is within bounds. Uh, here, you also have to have i uh, greater zero, of course, but if you make this comparison unsigned, you only need one comparison. Um, but anyway, so if we if we apply if we apply speculative gal motion to this uh, um, input code, first I mean the first guard that a is not now this condition is already loop invariant. That's rather easy to just hoist it out of the loop. Then we have the second guard, which is unfortunately loop invariant. It's like this. A comparison of this uh, loop uh, induction variable, but as I've said before, we can just rewrite that to some comparison that is um, uh, loop invariant. And we do that by, instead of comparing, we know that the i will be at most n minus 1, so we can simply do this kind of comparison. Which uh, is the problem. So basically, you, expect it, you, you make the last stronger. Be because you, the loop, you, you mean the loop could be uh, exited early, yes. yeah. yeah, right. But I mean, yeah, I mean you, you can also uh, do the analysis and see that maybe somewhere there is a condition that I, uh, and then you could take the max or the mean. But uh, yeah, you, you make you make the condition stronger. But the interest is that no, if you made it stronger, not weaker, uh, it's still okay. <laughs> Uh, and you and you can move this 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 guard now out of the loop. Um, but you're right. Maybe the condition is is not too strong, and will cause the optimization. But then we would register that in the in the speculation log, and not attempt it a second time. We would still do the first thing, meaning we will hoist the null check, but not uh, the bounce check, and not rewrite it as well. Um, yeah. Um, so. No, so that was the first uh, speculative optimization, that an example of speculative optimization in the first uh, stage that moves guards around. Um, now another example um, uh, of the speculative optimization, but this one doesn't move guards around, it inserts them. Uh, so again, it needs to be in the first stage. So if we have uh, the code above, uh, so it seems to just do stuff with arrays, um, but the, the tricky part here is that uh, somehow we're not really sure that actually um, the computation in one iteration don't depend on the previous iteration. Because in particular, uh, C and A could be allies. I mean, they could be the same array actually, right? And then you would have this problem, meaning uh, the, the computation of at one iteration depends on the, on the computation at the previous iteration. And usually that's not so good for things like vectorization. You'd want the two arrays to be definitely different so that we, we can apply, for example, vectorization easily to this example. Uh, and well, again, you can use speculation there. You just you want the, the arrays to be different, so just make them different. You guard that they are different, and then suddenly in everything that follows this guard, uh, you can apply this, 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 uh, you can assume that C and A are different, and for example, you can vectorize this loop now very easily. Um, another optimization uh, that can be done um, uh, in the first stage um, is, as because again, we are going to introduce guards, is segment elimination. I know that this is a bit controversial, some people don't like it, but the principle is the following. So here we have some loop. Uh, it doesn't really matter what the loop does, but the important point is that at the end of, at usually um, at, the, at the back edge of a loop, you need the save point check. And why do you need that? I think there's been already a few talks that have talked about save point. Um, the, the save point is somewhere where you want, uh, when you want to pause all threads in the VM. And usually this is during GC or can be also because of the optimization. Usually you want to reach the save point in a timely fashion. <coughs> if you have to wait for a long time for your GC, you're going to have latency problems, as we've seen earlier. 
um, in other talks. Um, and so usually uh, VMs insert save point checks, uh, so they which just check that a save point is needed or not, and if it's needed, they will pause and do whatever needs to be done. Um, usually this is inserted at the back edge of loops and at the entrance of method, or the exit of method, but at least one per, once per method. And usually this gives you uh, something that it's, it's hard to execute code for a very long time if you have no loops and you never enter methods, usually. Um, so, however, uh, a save point in hotspot happens to also be a pot potential de-optimization point. And this is very annoying because, uh, as we've said before, if we have uh, the optimization, if we have the optimizing instruction in the way, we will probably not be able to reorder side effects, meaning we will probably not be able to do any kind of vectorization. Um, but also, if the loop is very tight, a single save point can have a big influence. If you have very simple code, then just adding the save point code uh, can slow you down. So you'd want to remove that. And uh, an assumption that you can make um, is that, for example, if there is no call or no other loop with, within the loop body, right, uh, a modern CPU should be able to go through the int range fast enough. Meaning, if, if you have to do some arithmetics inside the loop and you know that this loop is going to run from zero to, I don't know, at most max int, right, uh, then you're good, you can remove the save point and probably a modern CPU should go through this computation in, I don't know, maybe a second to maximum. Um, so, but to make this assumption, you need to be careful. Because if you do that without looking too much, for example, without noticing that here it's not plus plus, but plus equals two, uh, you're going to run into a problem because actually this first loop without any checks on n can actually be an infinite loop. Because uh, if n is max int, then since you increment by two, you can you can uh, jump over the check, go back to minus uh, two minute, and go again forever and ever. And if you don't have a save point, some people will be very unhappy because uh, GC will never happen. The uh, VM is dead, basically. Um, so you have to be careful, and you can do it by inserting a guard that checks that this loop is guaranteed to be to not be infinite, to terminate. Um, so this is what we do here. You insert a guard, you use speculation, and you're able to remove the save point. Um, now, uh, of course, in the first stage, uh, there are many other optim speculative optimization you can do, uh, but I will not go through all of them. Uh, in particular, I, I tried to show you the ones, or some of them, that are interesting if you want to, um, that, that require the ability to late during the compilation process, insert new guards or move them. Um, so now I would like rather to present uh, a few things you can do in the second stage. So, uh, and, and the first thing uh, might be a little bit surprising since uh, it's actually not, I've been claiming that the second stage was for side effect optimizations and I'm actually going to present you an optimization that doesn't have anything to do with side effects. Um, but it can still only be done in the second stage. And this is called the optimization grouping. So the idea here is that, as I've said earlier, because of the transition between the two stages, we will very often have multiple de-optimizing instructions that, have this, that share the same de-optimization target, the same frame state. And so it's not too far-fetched to say, well, we can transform this first uh, control flow graph into this one, meaning instead of having two different they optimize instruction that anyway do the same thing because they deoptimize to the same target. We first merge and then we deoptimize. And this deoptimization is targeted at helping with the uh, metadata footprint uh, problem. And maybe it's not yet obvious because uh, at first we have two frames, one frame state, and at the end we have still one frame state. So it doesn't seem like we've done much in terms of deoptimization metadata. But actually we did. And the reason is, is the following. So if we look again at the first graph in a bit more detail, so of course we have the same de-optimization target, right? 
uh, and in the IR, this abstract target is the same. There is just one. However, if we were to emit code um, for this graph, we would have to emit actually twice the optimization metadata. And why is that? It's because even though it's the same abstract target, it's not the same. Uh, you don't need the same concrete data at both spots. Namely, in the first one, maybe for example, the local variables uh, are to be retrieved from some values on the machine stack. But it may be in the second uh, location where you de-optimize to the same target, the, the same abstract uh, local variables are actually found in registers. So you just need to emit the um, metadata twice. So this is why uh, de-optimizing once uh, with the same uh, frame state was a gain. Because in this case, you only emit metadata once in one place. Um, so I'm going to, to uh, go on a little sidetrack because actually, so I, I've, I've said this optimization is, is uh, targeted at um, helping with the metadata problem, but there are other uh, existing optimizations for that. In particular, uh, we, are in, we are using the hotspot VM and the hotspot VM also has uh, some tools to try to uh, fight this problem. And it has something that is called uh, de debug info sharing. And the way it works is when the compiler emits the, the, the metadata, it actually just encodes this frame that I've talked about in the beginning, just one after the other, just in a byte stream. However, it's very frequent that you have the same exact data because of inlining, for example, uh, you will have two frames that are very similar, where the registers are the same, etc., um, that follow each other. And for example, that's the case for these two frames there. And so what Hotspot does in this case is says, well, I don't really need the second one. It's exactly the same as what I had before. I'll just say, well, it's the same as before, right? So you gain one frame. And this happens very often. So overall, you can uh, reduce your um, Met metadata footprint this way. So now, if we look at the, these two techniques um, and their effect, so here I have the effect in particular that the three first groups are for various uh, Java benchmarks. And we can see that uh, the, the very interesting thing here, so sharing is what I just presented, this debug information sharing for hotspot. Grouping is the optimization I presented before the optimization grouping. Um, and we can see that these two optimizations actually um, collaborate very well because uh, if you use both at the same time, you actually get a bigger reduction. Um, so one is not a subset of the other, and on the contrary, they collaborate to reduce uh, your memory footprint. And so we can see that on uh, these Java benchmarks, we have about we have said about 30% uh, of the of the total occupation of the memory footprint. It's not just, this is not just uh, the optimization metadata, it's the whole uh, memory footprint of the code cache. So on, on, on Java code, like DACAP or SpecGVM, this kind of things, we've, we've reduced about the, the, the footprint by the 30%. However, it's much more interesting, um, uh, which is already a gain, but it's much more interesting. Uh, if you remember before, I showed you the state of affairs in Java, which was okay, but then I showed you the thing with this uh, JavaScript interpreter built on top of Truffle, and it was a bit catastrophic. Um, but actually, when we apply these two techniques, we actually uh, eliminated basically 90% of this footprint, and we come back to the same. So remember, we had a 10x uh, problem, right? Uh, JavaScript was 10x Java. Now we're back to Java. So uh, do you have what? Do you have the previous slide with updated numbers? Uh, no, I don't. Like, like absolute problem? numbers? No, yeah. I don't. Um, but yeah, I mean that's that's the overall result that you come back to similar numbers. So this PDF JS that was 350, maybe it's not 35 megabytes. Um, so, and which was I think 30 was the most the biggest usage for the DACA Pro benchmarks. So. You, it's back to the to the ballpark of um, of Java. Um, okay, 
Um, so uh, another optimization uh, that you can do in this second stage, this time finally it's really linked to uh, the um, side affecting instructions. Uh, so this is loop fusion. So the idea is we have uh, some code here that has two loops, one after the other. Uh, so the first loop creates some kind of temporary array uh, and in there stores two times uh, some uh, input array. And then we have another loop that takes this intermediate array and creates a new result that adds one to each element. So of course, I mean, you would say, I would never leave this in my source code, right? Uh, I would immediately, manually uh, put the two loops together and uh, be happier. Uh, however, uh, that's not really true, in fact, because uh, many people like abstractions, uh, and abstractions uh, actually uh, give rise to this kind of pattern. So developers never see this in their source code because they would fix it, but maybe they see some fancy framework that does uh, vector manipulation, and when you inline through it, you end up with this kind of code. So it's still an important thing to optimize. Um, and there, the optimization is just the compiler doing exactly the obvious thing to do, meaning putting the loops, the loops together and removing the, the need for the intermediate array altogether. So why am I talking about this? What was, I mean, so first, it has to do with side effects, right? You didn't do all the side effects of the first loop, right? Um, so the side effects have happened in a different order somehow. Um, but more importantly, if you think about it, uh, if, you, if you have any uh, safe point, right? If you have any safe point in those loops, sorry, any de-optimization, including safe points, uh, in those loops or in between those two loops, uh, it means that somehow they would, be, they would end up within this loop, um, and that would be a big problem. Uh, that would violate basically the rule we, we um, uh, established earlier, meaning if you have uh, the optimization in between two side effects, you cannot read other side effects. And here I think the reason why is, is rather clear because if you imagine de-optimizing, so returning to the interpreter after having only applied uh, partially the iterations of this loop, uh, so you would have a C array, right? So the array of C would be allocated and you would have some of the results uh, in the array but not the rest, but you would not have the B array at all. So where there is nowhere in this code that you could restart execution um, and have the correct state. Uh, yeah, so that's why this needs to be done in the second stage. Um, uh, then, another optimization that can be done in the second stage, uh, again, as a very direct link to side effects, uh, is effect syncing. So here we have a small loop where we're computing something, I don't know what, but we keep on reading and writing to some uh, field. So we keep on reading and writing to memory. And so we can probably very easily get, get rid of the read um, because just by uh, low store forwarding, that's not a problem, but we will still end up with the writes in the loop and that's just not very desirable. If we could write once, we'd be a bit happier. Of course, caches might help you, but if you don't have to do the write, you have less instructions in your loop probably it runs faster anyway. So effect thinking means we're going to try to basically virtualize the side effect within the loop and only apply the effect, only publish the effect uh, at the end of the loop. And that's again a, a reordering of um, side effecting instructions or at least we've changed the, or the, the way the side effects happen between this version of the program and this version of the program. So it has to be done in the second stage. And uh, you might notice as well that in these three examples I've given about loops, um, this optimization I talked about uh, earlier, which was the safe point elimination, is very important because if we had a safe point there, we could not have moved uh, the side effect over it, so we could not have moved it outside of the loop. Uh, so the optimizations of the first stage and the second stage, even though they are in different parts of the compiler, they actually still collaborate. Uh, optimizations of the first stage very often enable optimizations in the second stage. Okay, so that's the material I had. So if you have a question, any of it?